So let's talk a little bit about object-oriented programming because um, when I started my undergrad in computer science, it was for a while, the, it was very difficult to understand even though it's fairly easy and probably I guess it was because nobody spent too much time trying to explain in very detail and very simple terms what is object-oriented programming. Uh, but uh, before we go into uh, this type of programming, we should start with uh, the simplest uh, type of programming, which is called procedural programming. It is very simple and straightforward. It's something that everyone uh, is starting. That's the starting point for everyone who gets into the coding world, because it's a very easy top-down approach. Uh, you start from the top, you write line by line your code, and um, every line that you execute, you go to the next one and to the next one. Uh, it's very easy to understand and the basic building blocks for something like that are the decision condition structures, the if then else that you might have seen in other uh, languages. If a condition is met, then execute what uh, the first step, uh, else do something else. You have the loops where if a condition is met, that means that um, certain lines of our code are gonna be repeated as long as this con uh, condition is met. And finally, some uh, 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 the last languages that were following the, the procedural programming uh, introduced some functions and it was the in-between step between procedural programming and object-oriented programming where you had some specific functions which would do specific things that you could do and you could reuse them every time and you could, it would just call the function instead of, let's say, writing again and again all the, uh, the block of code that you needed to execute a specific function. Uh, if you need anything, you can speak up or say something. I have the chat in front of me. So if you want me to stop to explain anything, just let me know. So very quickly, a procedural programming, a very simple example. As I said, you start from the top, you're going uh, down. You have some variables that you initialize. And then let's say you have an if uh, condition. If this condition is met, then do something or bypass the whole uh, pr uh, the whole block of the if and continue afterwards and then you might encounter a for loop so for a specific number of loops do whatever is included in the for loop sometimes and then after you're done you can continue calling a second function for whatever reason uh, as you can imagine as we go in and write code line by line uh, if we want to have a very complex project, the program is going to get too big and it's going to be very difficult even to understand if you move away for a couple of months, let's say, from that project and then coming back trying to understand exactly what happened. So, as I said, large projects tend to become very difficult to maintain, update, change whatever you want. So, a very quick example. Uh, I'm pretty sure you have seen this picture of the, the code that was used to get us to the moon. Uh, this was, for other reasons, written in assembly, low-level uh, uh, programming language, and uh, it was a procedural programming. And in order to update, let's say, this code, if you, or if you figured out that there was a mistake somewhere in the code, you can understand and you can imagine how difficult it would be to go back and change something. So, as I said, it's difficult to maintain, adding new data, new function, it's not always the easiest thing to do. Uh, so, and even though it's very easy to understand at first because you're going line by line and it's very easy to understand a small uh, program what exactly it does, it's not based on the real world. What is based on the real world, on the other hand, is object-oriented programming. Uh, and everything is uh, organized around classes and objects and that's where we're gonna spend uh, our time today. Um, the, the main difference is the approach that we're using to uh, write our programs. We start from the uh, bottom up. We create our objects, our classes, and then we move to create more complex, um, uh, let's say, classes, methods, etc. We'll see some examples about that. Uh, so, in order to understand what's going on, the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, are the classes. The classes are essentially the prototypes, the blueprints on, um, on which we're gonna base the creation of our objects. Let's bring a real life example to 
uh, understand a little bit better what I'm saying. So, uh, but yeah, I just wanted to make sure that the blueprint, as a blueprint, it contains all the information about the properties of an object, if that object is, is to be created according to that class, and um, all the operations that a, an object belonging to that class should have. So, a real life example, cars. A very abstract definition, we all know what a car is, and even though you do not have a car, let's say you do, do not have a car right now, but you know what a car is, so you have the concept of the class. And if, let's say someone comes and says to you, I bought a car, so you move from the abstract definition of the object to the actual object, to an instance of that car. So you will need some kind of information. You're gonna ask your friend, hey, what did you buy? What is the make and model of the car? What is the year of the car? What, how many doors it have? How big is the engine? What, uh, how, how big is the gas tank, the mileage? Information that you, are, you know already comes along with the broad and abstract definition of the class of the car. So when we have an object, the car that our friend has bought, we need all this information in order to be able to initialize this, uh, this object. So he will tell us it, it's a Toyota Camry of the year 2016, it has four doors, 2.5 liter engine, and it has a uh, gas tank of size 14.5 gallons. So now we have an object. We moved into creating an actual thing based on a theoretical blueprint that was the class. And that actually gets us to the first uh, interesting concept that comes along with object-oriented programming, and that is the concept of encapsulation. What it simply means is that every object uh, belongs to itself. It hides most of the information inside itself, it keeps its state private, and if another object wants to uh, interact with the object and its attributes, the only way to do that is through specific methods that we have to give access to other objects to interact between them. Otherwise, nothing is exposed to the outer program. Uh, so all the attributes are protected inside the cell, let's say, of an object. So, and yeah, and most importantly, unless we explicitly try to do something like that, no other class or, or objects from other classes can actually access uh, this car, let's say, the, the Toyota Camry in this case. So that leads us to talk about methods. We have, as we said, um, the attributes of an object, but there are some methods that could affect the attributes of the model, uh, of an object. Some examples in this case with the car example, we might have um, a method which would be start the engine. And then it flips the attribute engine from uh, engine on from false because the car would be stopped to on because, well, now we turn the engine on. Or another method would be tank fill. So we would get uh, the, the tank that would be empty because it's a brand new car and we would fill it with gasoline. And that leads us to the second uh, important uh, characteristic of object-oriented programming, and that is abstraction. So we have the ability of different objects communicating with each other a lot, but uh, the good thing is that only a high level mechanism is exposed to, uh, to the other objects or even us, the end user meaning that the inner working of what's going on are hidden inside a black box. We don't need to know how the engine, how we managed to turn the engine on, we just have to know that this is the method we use to turn on our engine. And it's pretty close to how we use today our phones. We don't need to know exactly what happens when we're trying to unlock our phone, let's say with our face or our fingerprint. Uh, only the highest level of that interaction is exposed to us. The inner workings are hidden and protected from us. Uh, yeah, that is exactly what I said. So the engine now is on. We don't need to know why and how it happened. We just need to know that we requested it through a specific method and now it's on. And uh, we're getting closer to the third, and it's, that leads us to the third uh, um, important characteristic of the um, object-oriented programming, and that is the concept of inheritance. Uh, so 
objects tend to share a lot of characteristics, but not, they're not always entirely the same. What that means in our case with the cars, uh, all cars are cars, but some cars are different than others. So we might have pickup trucks, sedans, hatchbacks, vans. So there is a pattern class which is more generic, more general, and contains information that is spread out through all kinds of cars. And then you have the children of the cars, some more specific definitions of cars. So a pickup truck will have a flatbed at the, uh, on, the, on the back where you can load things. That's not the same as, let's say, a sedan. But both of them have an engine. Both of them have doors. Both of them have a gas tank. So there are some specific characteristics that um, belong to the mother, the parent class, and then some more specific characteristics that belong only to the child. So uh, the, ha the child inherits everything from the parent class, let's say the engine, the gas tank, the doors, the make and model and here, specific characteristics, but then it has a collection of um, characteristics that differentiates its child for, from everything else. So a pickup truck is not the same as a minivan. And, uh, this way, through inheritance, we don't have to rewrite everything that a child will have to do and all the attributes that a child must have. We just have to inherit everything from the parent class and then initialize uh, our specific properties that have to, have, that have to be uh, in the, uh, for when we initialize a child, let's say a pickup truck in this case. So, the pickup truck is going to inherit, as I said, the doors, the engine, and, and, but then you will have extra attributes in this case, which would be the existence of the flatbed or what would be the capacity of that bed. Is everyone okay so far? Am I moving too fast? Should I go back a little bit? Just let me know, please. Get it. And I need to get a drink too. Okay, Brian says we're good. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I'll have some examples how to implement all that in Python. And uh, so we're gonna move from the super generic explanation of the concept into something more specific, how to do that in Python. And uh, finally, the last thing that I wanna talk about is the, the fourth and uh, uh, characteristic of object-oriented programming, which is very important to us, is that of polymorphism. Essentially, it's the, you could say it's the same uh, as inheritance, but this time for the methods, meaning that we can use the methods of a parent class on the child in the same way that we did it on the parent class. So we don't have to rewrite and reinitialize and redefine that would be the more correct uh, way to say it. They redefine the methods uh, that appear on the child, on the parents. So let's say the method, uh, let's fill the tank of the, of the car with gas. We don't have to rewrite that for every child because it's a, uh, it's a common method that should appear to every child. And that is why we put it on the parent. So it will be inherited to every child and we can use that method um, in every child. So the start engine and the tank field should be over there for us available for every children that we might have. Uh, but specific methods for the children will have to be defined on the children level. In this case, let's load the bed of a pickup truck with cargo. So these are the four main uh, characteristics of object-oriented programming that you should try at least to understand. Uh, the good thing about the way that the coding world right now uh, works is that you will not have to write, most possibly, most possibly, you won't have to write your own classes. You need to understand what is going on. So when you go out, let's say on uh, Stack Overflow or GitHub, to get a class or uh, and some objects that pretty much do the work that you need to do in your specific program. But all you need to do is to be able to understand what's going on, alter a couple of things that you might need so you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you need to do something new. 
So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to move on over to Python where I have written some program, some uh, objects, the classes and the objects for the examples that I brought up about the car. So let's tile everything. So over here, I'm creating the class of the car. Uh, you might see specifically on this one uh, some different syntaxes around there on the internet. Uh, that's because um, the syntax to define a class in the newest version of Python is different than the 2.7 uh, version of Python that ArcMap is using. So you might see some differences. This is the way to actually define an object in uh, Python. So over here we say that we have a class car and we're going to have some objects from that. What I've done over here is that I have a class attribute that it should be distributed along every type of car because, well, that would be my definition of the car. It's a commercial use. So the moment I put something like that, this is predefined for every object that is going to be created for the class. It's going to have the type commercial. And then this is the first and most important uh, method that you have to do in every class that you're defining, uh, you define the method of initialization where you say, when I want to create an object based on that um, class, what does the outside environment, the user, let's say, has to give me in order to have all the information I need to create a car? Uh, given the example that I used on my presentation, we'll say that we're going to need itself, obviously the object, the make, model, year, the number of doors, the size of the engine, and the size of the tank in order to be able to initialize uh, this, uh, an, ob an object based on the car class. So what we're saying is that you'll take the, uh, the make in this case argument that is gonna be given to you, and you will get it into the object and store it into the make attribute. And the same will happen for everything else. Keep in mind uh, that Python is very uh, particular in terms of indentation. So everything that belongs in the class is already intended. And the definition, the, the, the inside part of the definition of the method is intended a second time. So we move out in this case and we're going to try to create our first object. So we're going to say that we have the Camry and it's going to be a car. And in order to do that, I need to give some arguments to the method, the initialization method, to create the first object. So we will have a Toyota Camry 2014, four doors, 2.5 liters engine, and 14 gallons of tank. And uh, let's say we'll try after we've done that to see if we have correctly created our first object, we're going to print out uh, the characteristics of this uh, object. So let's run this thing and hopefully everything is gonna work. Yes, it does. So the results given the, the print command that I have used over here is that this, is, uh, this car is a Toyota Camry made in 2014. It has four doors, 2.5 liter engine and a gas tank that holds 14 liters or gallons. Yeah, yeah, I made that mistake. It, that's what happens when you come from Europe. Uh, so, now we have created our first object. Any questions about that or do you need me to explain or add anything in the whole process? I will also uh, give, I will uh, post, when I post the, the recorded version of this video, I will also uh, give all the, the, the four scripts that I'm using over here to create the objects. So any questions? There aren't too many of us here, so if you want to speak with your microphone instead of writing on the chat, that should work as well. Hi, I have a question. Sure. Why do you have to have self again? Because this way we take everything that is given through an argument and uh, when we initialize an object through the class, we say take that and put it in yourself. And that happens because every time you go into the class and create a second object, so if I go ahead and create Camry 2, 
with exactly the same arguments, Toyota Camry 2014, Ford 2.5 and 14, this is going to be a brand new object. It's gonna, uh, I'm gonna have two identical objects with different names in order to differentiate them. And in order to achieve that, you need the self part. So you can say that, take this argument when you initialize the first, uh, for the, uh, the object for the first time and get that argument into yourself, self make. So you'll see what's going on in a little bit because when I'm gonna use some methods that I'm gonna create for my class, in the second uh, example that I'm going to use. In this case, if I want to use the method fill up the tank for the Camry, I will use Camry dot the name of the method that I'm going to use. So since there is no name when I'm initializing the, uh, the, the class and I'm creating the blueprint, the way to substitute that is by using the word self. I think I might have given you an answer. Okay, I think I get it. Okay, you. You'll get it a little bit better, I think, in the second example. And uh, so right now we only have a, a, an object of the car, but I, I'm going to go ahead. Yeah, sure. I have one question. Sure. I, I, the, the format for the init function has the two underlines, and I see that a fair amount in Python. Does that signify anything in particular to have the two underlines before the name of a Function. I guess this is the constructor in this case for that. Yeah, it's a constructor and um, I don't have a specific answer for you. My intuition would be that if we decide to sort all our, um, all our methods, this is going to pop up at the very first, at the very top, because that's where you need the constructor. I'm, 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 well, there should be a reason why there is why the people who created Python figured that the constructor, the initialization, should have the two underscores. But my two cents would be that it would be in terms of the sorting, it's always going to pop up at the very first, at the top. Are we good? I might have a better answer for you. Actually, it's a good question. I will look at it and maybe I'll have something. If I find something, I will post it on the discussion. That's good. I, I've, I haven't seen that with other programming languages. It seems like I only see that in Python. And I only see it with some of the functions that are defined. I just kind of, yeah, just, it's just kind of well, interesting. You're right. I haven't seen it el elsewhere as well. I have some experience, experience with Java and R a lot lately, but I haven't seen it anywhere else. So I'm guessing it's one of the quirks that every language, I mean, it's bound to have. All right. Thank you. So, I'm gonna go and move one step forward and um, get the car, uh, the, the definition of the class of the car and uh, define some methods. So in this case, I'm changing a little bit the definition of the class of the car. So we still have that it's a commercial vehicle. And in the initialization, I, I'm requesting exactly the same uh, number and uh, of attributes, the exactly the same attributes. But at the end over here, because I want to initialize and create the, uh, the method to fill up the gas tank, I'm saying that the, the gas in the tank attribute, I'm not expecting that to be given to me by the user. I'm just saying it's a brand new car. Nobody has been able to drive it yet. It has zero liters gallons in the tank. And that's why I'm going, uh, myself, I'm initializing this attribute of this object being zero. So in still, if you can see inside the class, in the detention, I'm, keep, I'm keeping the indentation over here, I'm defining a brand new method that is called tank fill, where again, I'm going to need itself because it's going to affect the attributes of the, um, of the object. And the object that I, and also I'm gonna need the second argument, which would be what is the gas quantity? How much gas do you want to put in the, uh, in the, the tank? So what this method is doing is it's, uh, it says to the, uh, it's, uh, inside the class, the blueprint is that it will take the attribute gas in the tank and it will add to what is already inside the tank, the gas quantity that I'm requesting. That is the, plus equals sign uh, is um, over there to do. It keeps the already existing amount of, uh, let's say in this case, gas inside the tank and adds the, uh, the gas quantity 
that I'm using. So you'll see that in action. And uh, I'm also wanted to see how much gas I'm going to have after I fill uh, the, the gas tank. So I'm getting, uh, I'm requesting a return message. There are uh, gas in the tank gallons in the tank of the car. So again, what I'm doing in order to use that, I'm, I'm going to create the exactly the same object as before. And then I'm going to go and say, since my name of my object is Camry, I'm going to use the tank fill uh, method on the Camry object that I have created. So, and then in order to see how the plus equal sign actually works, I'm going to fill it up a second time, the first time with two gallons and then with 10 more. So let's see what's going on over here. And we're getting these results. At first, it started the object with zero over here because I said during the initialization of the object that the gas in the tank should be zero. And then I'm adding two and then I'm adding 10 more. So that's why we're getting two messages. At first, we're getting two gallons and then two plus 10, 12 gallons inside the Toyota Camry. Are we good with the methods? Again, what I'm saying is over here is that probably you will not have to initialize and create your own objects and classes, at least not, nothing too uh, convoluted, nothing too uh, crazy. But you need to have a general understanding when you're finding code online to understand what's going on and what do you need to edit and alter in order to be able to reuse it in your own programs. So, uh, any questions about the methods? So, is it true that a method, since it's used by a class, it can, it seems like it's returning like gas in a tank and make and model. So, it can use the, I guess, the parameters of the class? Yes. Okay. So, essentially, that goes back to the, um, the encapsulation that I was saying uh, during the presentation, where the attributes uh, by themselves are protected. So, if it was a procedural programming and let's say X was the gas tank, I would start with X equals two and then X equals 10. I, will have, I would be able to have direct access to the attribute. This is not happening anymore. I have, uh, I'm only able to alter uh, the, the attributes of a class through a method. And there is only a specific, um, let's say, number and types of other objects or users that are available, uh, that, that have the privilege and the rights to use the method and alter the attributes of a class. So everything in there is protected. And obviously over here, it's a very simplistic method, doesn't do anything uh, in particular. Uh, there might be some methods that are hundreds of lines, but I do not have to know exactly what's going on inside the method. I just need to know that this method does that for me and it's changing the attributes. Thank you. Okay, awesome. So what I'm going to do after this one is open up this over here. Oh, yep, tile. And I'm gonna create a child class based on the car. So again, most of it is exactly the same. I have the car class, the commercial, again, the same arguments, the gas in the tank, the, the method that I have created, that I created for uh, the car. And then I'm going to create the child class of the pickup truck. What I'm saying over here is that the, uh, I'm defining a class, it has the name pickup truck, and I'm saying, I'm designating over here that this actually is uh, an extension of a car object. So everything that uh, is declared of and defined over here should be available to me in the child part of um, the, uh, this class, which is a child of the class car. So in order to initialize it, again, I'm going to use the same arguments that are required for a car up until the tank. And then because it has some extra elements, as I said before, in this case, just the bed capacity for the cargo that a uh, pickup truck can um, actually use for you, uh, I'm inserting an extra argument at the end uh, of the constructor. So I'm saying that since this is a car, what you need to do is use the initializer, this method from the car class, 
and do exactly what the car class is supposed to do over, over here. And then additionally, for this class, uh, for this child class, get the bed capacity uh, from the argument that it was given to you. And then since it's brand new and nobody has put anything on the bed, just say that the bed fill, the, the capacity for cargo is set at zero, or not the capacity, the actual cargo right now is set at zero. And then since this is a, a child class, the, the tank fill should be available for us to use in the child class, but we have the specific method over here, which would be load the bed, where we would get some cargo and throw it on the bed of the pickup truck so we will have something to carry around and then it will return for us a message so what i'm doing over here i'm creating our first pickup truck this is uh i'm gonna call it a ram i'm using the pickup truck which is the name of the class and i'm saying this should be a dodge ram in 2019 four doors five uh, i guess windows 19 gallons of uh, capacity in the tank and 350 whatever capacity in the in the bed in the back and then I'm gonna fill it with um, some gas because I need to be able to use the methods that are coming from the parent class and then I'm gonna use and load the bed uh, of the of the RAM uh, with something that I want to move around so if I was to run this thing over here this is our results at first, we get three gallons of gas inside our tank and then added three, 13, so the total should be, over, as you can see over here, 16. So the method, even though it was declared at the parent class, it is available and works exactly the same in the child object. And then we say that um, the bed right now holds 43 kilos of cargo on the bed. And a very simplistic, again, example of how to define a panel class and then extend it into having a child class. Any questions? I guess we're good. If you want to ask anything, just let me know. And then what I've done over here is I changed things a little bit. Uh, so even though you'll, in terms of the, um, the classes and the material for the classes, you'll see the if structure on the second week. If you have any experience and exposure to coding, you will know that they're available to use some if structures. And I'm just using over here one to um, protect, let's say, our object for from um, overloading it with cargo. So what I'm doing is I have exactly the same here, exactly the same class definition of the car, almost exactly the same thing for the pickup truck, uh, the same initializer, but I'm, what I'm doing is I'm changing uh, a little bit the previous definition of load the bed. And what I'm saying is that if whatever is available already um, on the bed field, plus the cargo that I'm getting that the user wants me to throw in the on the bed is um, less than uh, this could have been less or equal to tell you the truth uh, that the bed capacity that means that I can throw the cargo safely on the bed on the back of my pickup truck and I would say now we have this many of kilos of cargo on the bed of my truck else which would mean the opposite, that the bed fill plus the tendon cargo to be loaded would be larger than the capacity, I would get another message, which would be too much cargo cannot load, the total load remains at that. So the cargo wouldn't be added to the existing uh, load on the pickup truck. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna keep the same things with the, uh, with the tank fill, and then I'm gonna load up the, tr uh, the, the bed with something that uh, can be loaded only 43 kilos and then 200 which would be less altogether than 350 and then I'm just gonna try and overdo things and see what will happen so again we're getting these messages the first two are exactly the same because we didn't change anything in the method of the tank fill and then um, 
I have the first load of 33 kilos plus 200, it gives me 243 kilos. And uh, then I try to get over a ton and I'm getting the message too much cargo cannot load and the total lo load remains at 243. Just a quick example of uh, how many things can happen inside the method that we don't actually have to know about. So again, uh, the user, uh, you as a user, only need to know that you'll need to know the name of the object, the method, and you don't really have to know what is going on uh, in the inside, in the black box of a method. So in this case, we added the protection to not break the car by throwing too much cargo on the back of the pickup truck. And uh, any questions about that? Pretty much that's on the, the full extent of what I had for you today, especially for the people who have no uh, zero to, to little experience uh, working with object-oriented programming languages. So any questions you might have are welcome. And if you happen to think anything, just feel free to throw it on the discussion board.